44 years ago, we were at the bowling alley with a lot of uh, people from Napa who were there with the veterans trying to help them reintegrate into society. And that was the whole idea with this. It had been highlighted since we covered it a number of times, including a, a, a movie and, a, and at least one uh, other uh, setup uh, that was done, I believe, by the Smithsonian, um, just because they'd been so successful. So this is truly heartbreaking, David, for those who were lost here. Uh, and right now, there's, it's really uncertain whether this program will go forward and how it will go forward if it does. David? And I remember those segments so well, Adam. It, it, it was a great, it is a great program. It's just, it's an absolute tragedy that yeah, uh, they, women who gave their lives to this program literally uh, came to this end. Go ahead, Adam, quickly. Hey, David. Yeah, and you make a great point. You know, we two of the two of the women killed actually approached us. We were doing a different story here about three months ago, four months ago, and they approached my producer Mike and I and Tom, our photographer, and were were encouraging us to come back out and do a follow up. And so we thought about doing it. In fact, she emailed us one of the women that was killed here. And so you know, to hear that uh, and to tell people at home the significance of how well they had done. They had treated almost 500 men here, and they were trying to open up a women's program as well. And these were the ones that were given up. The VA had given up on for the most part. Mm. And of those nearly 500 men over in the high 90 percentile had succeeded yeah. in, in overcoming their PTSD and moving on with their lives. It's so this is really, really that unfortunate. Out. Adam Housley, thank you very much, Adam. Appreciate it. Well, right. Sacramento, California, Sheriff Scott Jones joins us now. Uh, Sheriff, for those who aren't familiar with the map, uh, uh, Yonville is, is, is west of where you are, but were you called in at all on this situation? No, we were not. It was mostly the CHP and the Napa County Sheriff's Office and some other agencies that were around, but they had, uh, they had enough resources, so we weren't called. It's just a, a terrible tragedy. I, I, I want to move on to immigration, if I may. That's why we, we called you up for the interview in the first place. You, you guys in California are in a very difficult position, law enforcement, where, where you are stuck between a state uh, that is advising you not to cooperate with federal officials and federal officials who are advising you to cooperate with them. Uh, how do you survive in a, in a pull and tug like that? Well, it's very difficult. First of all, thanks for having me on, David. I Thank appreciate you. it. And, you know, this is not the first thing, although the most sensational is the Sanctuary State Bill, but we've had the Trust Act and the Truth Act, and, and all of these things have pitted us squarely in the middle of state law. We could comply with state law or federal law or neither, but, but never both. And so I've actually personally gone back to Washington during the last uh, administration trying to say, what are you guys going to do? Are you going to s assert your supremacy? And, I, you know, being an attorney as well, I understand the conflict between state and federal law and federal issues. Well, uh, let me, let me just ask you, though, have, have you been advised by state officials not to cooperate with federal officials? Well, in a sense, uh, you know, as far as the community involvement and in doing operations with ICE, really no California law enforcement does that, and we're no different, although that's what they tried to portray to get this thing sold. Uh, for our concern, and mainly the sheriffs, because we are in charge of corrections, uh, the piece that we needed to maintain was our relationship with ICE inside of our jails, where the bad guys already are, so they could take custody of them according to their priorities. But the bad guys in a are, safe are, are, are being let out. I mean, essentially what the that's Oakland the mayor did, she tipped off. A lot of bad guys, and again, these are not dreamers we're talking about. These are many hardened criminals were given a tip that the feds are coming from this woman. Uh, doesn't that endanger yeah. people in your community? Well, it does. It endangers them because it allows uh, very dangerous people to go unapprehended. Uh, but it also endangers the lives of the officers that are going out to try and serve some of these warrants and pick up these folks um, that have advanced that have advanced notice that the officers are coming. So whatever they might be inclined to do, they have advanced notice, and that puts the the ICE officers and all the officers. Have you that tried might go to, to reason with the Oakland mayor? Because you're not all that far from Oakland. That that what she is doing is endangering people in your community uh, that you have sworn to to keep safe. You know, I, I haven't talked directly with the Oakland mayor. I think that was probably the tipping point, uh, or at least one of them, why the federal government finally decided to assert its supremacy and get some clarity as far as the immigration law. I have talked to the attorney general, uh, Javier Becerra, about it um, and talked to him about what he why said he believes to you? it. Well, uh, for example, I asked him directly if, if he thought that California is, was on equal or greater footing to pass immigration law than the federal government. And he asserts, of course, which he has said publicly many times, that it's not immigration law that California is passing. It's public safety law according to the Tenth Amendment. Well, the Tenth Amendment is 28 words long, and it basically says anything not reserved for the feds or left to the states. But you don't get to that analysis because clearly immigration is left yeah. entirely to the federal government. And so 
Um, you know, that's the battle we're on. It's, it's not trying to invalidate everything that California's done. I think uh, the attorney general, who I met with after his remarks here with, a, with some law enforcement leaders privately, um, I think his intent here was to be a little bit surgical and to try and invalidate certain right. of the provisions that clearly well, impeded Without getting into the, the weeds, I mean, it's, it's a very simple argument. Uh, if the people are, are being endangered by these policies, they've got to be stopped. And it puts you guys in a terrible position between the feds and the state. We've got to leave it at that, Sheriff. We thank you very much for coming in. We appreciate you My being pleasure. here. Well, you probably remember Andrew Pollack's emotional plea for school safety after his bill across the finish line. You have inspired all of us. Thank you for having the strength to fight as you continue to grieve. Florida Governor Rick Scott signing a new school safety and gun control bill and thanking Andrew Pollack for helping make it happen. Andrew says he's making it his mission to make our schools safer after losing his beloved daughter, Meadow, in that horrific Florida school shooting. And with us now is Andrew Pollack. This is his first appearance since getting that bill signed yesterday. Uh, Mr. Pollack, thank you so much for coming. I, I just want to say, first of all, that, that I know and I would encourage people out there to continue to pray for Meadow's eternal soul and for your family because I understand that it still is helping you in doing what you're doing, no? Yes, Dave, thank you. It's, uh, it's empowering me to keep moving on and continue with my mission. And my mission is not to just have it done in Florida, but to continue on and go to every state and meet with every governor across the country and have them do the right thing before there is a, another tragic event. Well, does this Florida bill make schools safer? Yes. Uh, let me explain that what happened in Florida, you know, Dave, the country's so divided right now, the left and the right. So what happened in Florida, it, it's historic. W myself and, and like you heard the governor on the clip, Ryan, another, another father, we were in, up in Tallahassee. And what's historic is we were able to get the left and the right to come together, put away, put aside all political differences and focus on what the American people want. And what we all want is our kids safe in school. That was the main focus. So when and we were able to come together and and it was pretty it was pretty incredible to see it in front of my eyes. And it was something that. I'm very proud of that we got this done in Florida for all these kids. Well, now, and as, as, and as you know, everything is not completely rosy now. I mean, they, you have, the NRA is, is suing uh, the state of Florida for this thing because of one part of it does increase the age uh, at which you have to be in order to purchase some of these guns, uh, increases it from 18 to 21. Uh, that's why Correct. the NRA is suing. Now, I remember so well, I was covering uh, when you were at the White House, when you were delivering that extraordinary, uh, it turned into a speech, but I know you didn't mean it to be so, but about your daughter and what this meant. You said, I don't want this to be about guns. We can talk about guns later. Uh, this has to be about Correct. keeping our kids safe. That's what this is about. But it, it does. A way with this NRA lawsuit, be, it is turning into guns in a way. No. Well, the, that's the problem with the media, Dave. They, they're, they're twisting it. They already, if you look on a, a lot of the other news channels and in the in the TV on newspapers, it's all about they're making it like gun legislation. But the whole bill is really mostly keep it about keeping our kids safe, about mental illness. There's so many good qualities in the bill. And for them, to just mention the word gun, it's just, it, it's not doing, it's not even helping. So yeah. they got a different agenda. My agenda is the school safety. And if anyone wants to look at the bill, they could they could see it. I have it posted at RememberMeadow.com, and you could go through the bill, Dave. There's so many good things, and then you see them mention one little thing in it, which it, it's, it, it saddened me when I saw that. Now, how are you going to try to duplicate in other states what you've done? Didn't. So, Florida, what was very important on getting this uh, bill passed was I wanted Florida to lead 
by example. So I have something now that we accomplished, which was great, bringing the two parties together. So I'm putting together with the help of the governor and Pam Bundy, I'm going to put together a draft bill that I think we could streamline across the country after after what I experienced in Tallahassee, I'm going to put something together that's going to be simplified. Yeah. And I'm going to be able to go to every governor in the state and get them on board to be proactive and, and just helping our kids, Dave. That's what the American people, that's what we're this this uh, uh, the shooter himself and indications that that not only local officials, but also uh, federal officials, the FBI in particular, lost opportunities to get this guy and, and prevent him from doing harm before he did. Governor Scott had put in this bill and the, the Speaker of the House that they worked on. It's going to give the police the ability to, when they get called out, say you call the police on your neighbor, he's acting irrational. The police go out to that person's So if that bill was in place, just that part of the bill, my daughter would be alive. So the, the, they, they would have been able to take any weapon in the house and confiscate it. So that, that's just one part of the bill yeah. that my daughter would be alive. You know, you've, you've, you've had such... ...negative feelings and emotions and energy going around in your soul over these past few weeks. I'm just wondering if you, if you have any left for what happened with those signals and the missed signals, uh, the FBI missing indications that the shooter was a madman or that uh, uh, that local police officials dropped the ball so often. Do you, do you harbor any grudge against them? Oh, Dave, I, I don't think about it because I know they're, that they're going to get theirs. I want to focus on all my energy that's coming through me because right now I, I'm unstop, uh, unstoppable. I, I can't be stopped. So I want to focus all that energy on positive stuff and prevention. They're, that's all going to come out, all that stuff. There'll be lawsuits. They'll be in court. They're going to, and they have to live with it, all that incompetence. So I'm going to take what's funnel my, all, my energy and move forward. Well, you know, and that's you have, my mission. You have so many millions, literally millions of people that are pulling for you for what you're doing, that are praying for you and your daughter. Uh, you, you mentioned RememberMeadow.com. What would you say, finally, is the best way for all of us who care so much about you and your family for us to honor your daughter's memory? Sure. First, you mentioned the prayers. Something's happening. So everyone who's praying, it's definitely working. I have a lot. I can't stop. I can't even tell you the energy that I have from everybody. I feel it. Uh, number two, I had a vision, Dave, when I uh, sitting at my house that that it's going to come true. I had a vision not of going to the cemetery and looking at my daughter's grave. I had a vision of a unbelievable playground, uh, like a princess playground that would be that my daughter would be so proud to run around in. So instead of going to a cemetery, I have some people working on building this playground in Coral Springs where I'm going to be able to go and sit on a bench and watch the kids play. So if anyone's out there and wants to help that vision come true, they could go to RememberMeadow.com and, and they could see what's going on with the playground. But more importantly also, they could follow me on my crusade across the country because there's strength in numbers I've learned when it comes to lawmakers. And, and I want to be able to help the people. That, that's my mission. I want to be able to help the kids and, and all the grandparents out there. No grandparent or parent should ever have to go through what I did and bury a child. There's strength in numbers, but there's strength in prayer, no doubt about it. You're an inspiration. There Andrew. is, Dave. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thanks, Dave. Are with you. Thank you. We'll Thank be right you. back.
2003, uh, 2002, 2003 steel tariff is a great case study in what happens when you institute a tariff. 200,000 American jobs in steel using industries were lost, and, and some of these jobs were lost in some really key states that President Trump won. So I think it's a, it's, history tells us that these are not a very good idea. Um, is it important for us to have very strong trade agreements that, you know, that don't put it, the United States at a disadvantage? Right. Absolutely. Right. But we, we, do, we don't want to abandon free trade and the, the benefits that it provo yeah. provides for our country. And I think, Steve, what we have seen over the past couple of days when the president has roll back a lot of these uh, a lot of the the, the the real toughness on the tariffs if, when it first came out they were saying all his advisors saying no exemptions at all well now there are several exemptions and there may be more I think the president is realizing that and he is dialing back the whole process no well that's right and then talking about jobs the industry steel industry employs 140,000 construction industry 6.3 million American manufacturing companies six and a half million 13 million versus 140,000 there are better ways to deal with this kind of situation and as has been pointed out we've seen this movie before not only with George W Bush but with Ronald Reagan right. he learned the hard way that you end up doing more harm than good well and Bruce in fact uh, we saw the uh, we mentioned the jobs numbers being responsible at least in part for the incredible 400 point gain in the Dow yesterday some of it though was also because the president has pulled back a little bit on the tariffs right well he could but I think one of the problems is is that like this policy like so many of them the immigration so forth he is not either not seeking advice of his getting the advice of his advisors or it's just so scattershot and he doesn't really understand and then finally there is a market reaction and that is one thing that he does understand apparently and then then he reverses course and so it doesn't make a lot of sense but it does anger our allies and that's not good well patrice it depends on which advisor he's talking to of course gary Cohn, uh... who's who's leaving the white house or at least that position the economic position in the white house was against the tariffs and that may be one reason why he left the president the president made it absolutely clear in his campaign that he was for tariffs that he was he was he thought that we had signed all kinds of bad trade deals and as you mentioned before patrice we have and the and over time by the way the nafta deal has changed even more favorable towards mexico against us so things need to be tweaked and maybe this is just a process of tweaking that we're in right now I mean, it is. What, what, talking about his advisors, though, it would be interesting to see who is going to be appointed to that position. You know, if you have someone who's going to be a, 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 not a, a free market, more of a nationalist perspective, then we might see more of these, uh, these types of tariffs. Or maybe we'll see some changes to monetary policy, which also deals with the trade deficit. And that's something that President Trump wants to deal with. What is interesting, though, when you go back to what he, he wrote about and talked about in the 2000s, he wants to be negotiator in chief. And so he will probably be taking a very active Active role in in the the trade agreements that well, we let's hope so. He knows with. how to, he knows how to make a deal. Uh, Steve, have you been hearing anything? Because we, the, some of the nominees include vast differences. I mean, people like Larry Kudlow, who's a big free trader, kind of against any kind of tariffs any time, to to some buddy like Navarro, who is one of the guys, the chief inventor of these tariffs. Yes, that's right, and that, that's why this appointment is going to be so critical. I don't think the president's made up his mind yet as who's going to uh, fill that post, but uh, that's going to be a signal. Is he want to uh, get new agreements, or are we going to descend to what nobody wants into a trade war? That's why the next 15 days, David, are going to be so critical. Not Would only you take the job? David. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a no, Steve. That's not a no. It was a serious question. Uh, well, I'm flattered, but uh, no, I'd rather be talking with you on Saturday. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, who do you think, Bruce? I mean, because you are more favorable to the position of tariffs, who do you think? Do you think it should be a free trader or somebody like Navarro, one of the people who created the tariffs? Well, I do think that it would be good that we had somebody, I mean, Steve would be good, he has the ability to communicate, and I don't agree with Larry Kudlow, but Larry Kudlow has the ability to communicate, and this was kind of the final humiliation for Gary Cohen, I mean, we thought he was going to leave when he was upset about the, uh, what Trump said after the Charlottesville uh, uh, neo-Nazi parade, and now he's going, I don't think he's going to get to go back to Goldman Sachs, because, uh, he, 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 you know, he wasn't rising to the CEO job there, so... Uh, he was ineffective. So I think what uh, Trump needs is somebody to be able to communicate what he's trying to do. Patrice, you have 15 seconds. Who do you think the, the nominee should be or will be? I, I do hope it's somebody who's a more of a free market oriented person. Okay. All right. Very My good. choice is Larry Kudlow. Oh, Larry Kudlow. Put that on the record. <laughs> <All right. laughs>